crypto will be successful if we can provide an alternative infrastructure that doesn't require communities to choose between autonomy and interoperability. So at the moment, you really have this dichotomy where communities, even ones that want to be you know, more economically self-sufficient, must choose if they want interoperability to use like global fiat currencies. They must choose to use the dollar or the euro or the yen, you know, one of these large currencies to interoperate economically with the rest of the world. And using those currencies makes them really like dependent and subject to you know censorship or sanctions or just manipulation. What's up, everyone? We are now almost one month out from DAS London, the largest institutional conference in all of crypto. That's happening March 18th through the 20th, obviously in London. This one's gonna be a blast. We are almost 10 times oversubscribed for tickets, which is pretty nuts. So again, we've had to lower the discount to Bell 10 and better yet, make sure you bring your friends. We sell a four pack of tickets. Find people in your company, bring your boss, bring your family, bring your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is, just go. You're gonna get a discount if you use that team pack. Run, don't walk. Make sure you go get those tickets today and cheers and see you in sunny London town. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now, let's jump into the episode. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the first interview episode of the multi-chain endgame season. Today, uh, Hart and I are going to be speaking with Chris Goes, one of the co-founders over at Anoma. Now, the reason why we wanted to start the season off with Chris is because he is a superpower where he can talk about concepts was a very high level philosophical 10,000 foot vantage point kind of view, but he can also get really in the weeds and the nitty gritty details. And that comes from his background as a protocol designer at Tendermint, where he worked on IBC and currently what he's doing at Anoma. So we got Chris's thoughts on everything from the current issues with blockchains as they exist today um, to where he sees this industry going in the future. Some of the design decisions around Anoma, this is where we got really into the weeds on intents and interoperability in between different blockchain trust zones. We talked about protocols starting uh, to basically unbundle and competing on the basis of what the protocol actually does versus the currencies that they export. Finally, we ended this episode by asking Chris what he would see as a satisfying end game for crypto. And he gave one of the best answers to this I have ever heard. So really hope you enjoy this interview with Chris. We'll get right into it. Um, yeah, enjoy guys. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Today, I'm joined by my co-host for this season, Hart Lamber, and we are going to be talking to Chris Gose, uh, the founder of Anoma. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We have been uh, really, really looking forward to this conversation and want to use this uh, as, an un uh, as an opportunity to unpack um, some of the big themes of this season. And uh, for listeners who haven't heard Chris before, I think, Chris, you're very good at um, kind of speaking at all levels uh, of the stack. So high level philosophy, but also being able to go down into very, very technical specifics and, you know, not to put you on the spot, but I think we want to make full use of your range today and kind of get your thoughts on some of the, the high level architecture and almost philosophy of where we're going in crypto, but also ask you some very specific technical questions. And for listeners who are trying to get a chart of uh, the agenda for today's talk, we're almost going to do a technical sandwich. We're going to start with some of the higher level stuff, get into the meat of the technicals, and then end uh, with some of the, the broader implications. But Chris, I thought uh, just as a jumping off point, you have mentioned a a talk uh, given by Moxie Marlinspike, uh, the founder of Signal before, as kind of this um, very influential uh, discussion about uh, and you something that you took away for a lot of stuff about blockchain architecture. So you give us an overview of what this talk was and how it influenced or helped you see, uh, helped you understand some of the stuff that's broken with uh, how we think about blockchains today. Well, I'm very happy to plug this talk again. Uh, more people need to watch it because it will save you years of your life, at least if you're working on blockchains. So the talk is a talk by Moxie Marlin Spike, uh, the founder of Signal, although he no longer works there. Um, and it was a talk given at 36C3, I guess the 36th Chaos Computer Congress in Germany. The talk is called The Ecosystem is Moving. You can find it online. It's about 30, 35 minutes. It's definitely worth watching. And I don't know all of the context, but I think this talk was given by Moxie basically in response to a bunch of people complaining that Signal wasn't fat. 
So early on in the life life cycle of Signal, the protocol and the application, you know, really before it was like anywhere near as popular as it currently is, you know, uh, that emerged from a kind of you know hacker cryptography community, and a lot of them were into building federated chat protocols, as in protocols like Matrix, where there are a bunch of different servers operated by different people, and there's a common protocol that connects all of them, uh, so it's like pretty decentralized. Different people can use different server providers, and they can still talk to each other using the same protocol. And Signal early on experimented with various, uh, you know, approaches to this, um, but decided not to be decentralized, decided to operate a centralized server, uh, still build, of course, all the encryption so that the server can't read your messages. The server has very few permissions, but uh, they decided to operate it in a centralized fashion. Um, and this talk was basically a talk by Moxie explaining why he made that decision. And what he explains in the talk is that he understands Signal's competitors as basically centralized chat services like WhatsApp and um, I don't know, uh, Facebook Messenger, stuff like this. And all of those services are controlled by companies. And one big advantage of centralized control, uh, in fact, maybe the primary advantage, is that it allows you to change the protocol quickly uh, because you know Facebook is a company, because um, WhatsApp, you know, separate back then, was a company because Google is a company. They can upgrade the protocol, and they can upgrade the pro protocol in particular to give users more features, like emoji reactions and images and faster chats. You know, all the stuff that people want, right? And the critical disadvantage of decentralization, in this sense, the reason Moxie decided not to federate Signal, according to this talk, is that it would make it basically impossible for them to keep up with that speed of change in just what users want and what users expect out of a chat protocol. And if Signal wasn't able to keep up with the centralized services, then everyone would just use, you know, WhatsApp because WhatsApp would have emoji reactions and images and automatic memes and all of the stuff that people find fun in engaging in chat protocols and Signal wouldn't because Signal, Signal would be deployed on like 150 independent servers and those 150 independent servers would never agree with each other uh, on a protocol upgrade, you know, any more frequently than like once every few years. Um, so uh, the relevance of this talk to blockchains, um, I think blockchains have a very similar characteristic um, as the thing which basically Moxie was trying to avoid. They're distributed systems, and once you deploy them in practice, you know, they are trying to be decentralized, right? Um, it's very, very difficult to change them. Uh, this is perhaps doubly true in the case of uh, blockchains with tokens where crypto economics is involved due to a selection effect. So once you launch something like Ethereum or Bitcoin, or Cosmos Hub, or Solana, these different chains, that chain starts out with an initial sort of crypto economic model. And people basically join the community in part because they agree with the model, right? It's very transparent what, you know, how, at least for the most part, not always to whom, but typically how much of the asset there is, how it's being issued, what the rules around gas and fees and redistribution are, stuff like this is quite transparent. So people join the community um, you know, in part on the basis of those expectations. And this meet, makes it very, very difficult to change both the kind of actual computer protocols, just because you need to get so many people to coordinate, and the economic distribution functions of these systems. Um, and that means that if you make a mistake, or if something that you design is not exactly what your users end up wanting, uh, it's very difficult to change it. Often what happens is that users just shift to a new and different system, which can make choices which are better for them. Um, so the the does that does that make sense? It's kind of a summary of the talk. Yeah. So you have the Bitcoin core dev problem. Nothing changes. Right. I mean, this can be a feature or a bug, depending on how you look at it. I'm not necessarily saying that it's bad, but that it uh, is something that's helpful to be conscious of, because I think some people have this idea that they'll like deploy blockchains like a sort of iterative MVP process. That, yep. Say a Silicon Valley startup might use. And that works yep. really well for Silicon Valley startups because they can pivot in like a board meeting on a Friday yep. evening and blockchains can't. No, it makes perfect sense. And I totally get it. There are pros to it. If you want to have digital gold, that's super stable and doesn't change. Um, but if you're trying to invent the future, kind of hard. So so how did this lead to Anoma? Like, I, I, I kind of see where you're going here, but like, what, what's the, uh, how'd you go from there to what you're doing now? Well, uh, yeah, the path is, is definitely not linear, but there's there's some, I can't, uh, tracing back all the causality is, is a uh, Herculean effort. But this talk was definitely a big inspiration. I think in part, it made me very cautious 
uh, like I really didn't want to make the wrong decision and deploy a system that would, uh, you know, for example, I had the experience of working on IBC, right? The interoperability protocol used by the Cosmos ecosystem and starting to expand to Ethereum rollups recently. Um, and IBC makes a lot of decisions. Uh, and some of them, I think now with the benefit of hindsight, were wrong. Um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of how it considers concurrent state machines and just how the protocol is architected. And I think it's basically impossible to change this. <laughs> so uh, it's a bit unfortunate. You know, I spent a lot of time working on that. Um, and I would rather, um, uh, you know, work on things that will be around for a long time. So um, one way, one lesson that Anoma takes away from this, at least, is that we actually try to make as few decisions as possible in the architecture of the protocol. Uh, we, as, in particular, we try to not make decisions on like very specific primitives that are probably going to change in the future. A good example of this is something like a zero knowledge proof system. So zero knowledge proof systems keep getting better, which is fantastic, except that it means that if you standardize one, it's going to be out of date in two years. Definitely, there's going to be a faster one. Um, so when we think about Noma, of course, like the actual instance will run with a specific zero knowledge proof system at a specific time, but we try to incorporate that heterogeneity of components into our design. So we expect that different people will be using Anoma with different proof systems and the proof systems will change over time. And we don't tie any of our architectural decisions or design decisions to a specific choice there. I think that's our main takeaway. Yeah. And that's where I think we start to, to get into this idea of intense as well. Chris, and this is where maybe it would make sense to, why don't, why don't we try to compare and contrast, I think, with, so we, we've sort of outlined one of the core problem statements, and this has been a problem statement going all the way back to the days of Bitcoin, where there's something that's a feature and a bug at the same time, depending on how you look at it, which is this immutability, this idea of immutability. Once, once you build it, it can't change. Um, you have to couple that with the idea that these are Essentially, and this is a metaphor that I've, I've or an analogy that I've heard you use quite uh, quite often is we're building operating system. There's a technical component. We're trying to onboard users, and obviously, we need to iterate, make decisions, and make changes there. So, I think one of the we're at this sort of interesting point uh, in crypto where there's a little bit of a a fish who doesn't know they're in water uh, type thing. You know, like uh, old fish goes up to yeah, uh, old fish goes up to young fish and says, uh, you know, how's the water today? And the young fish says, what's water? And so I, I would love to understand from your perspective, because I think whenever you get into something like Intense, people are like, why couldn't I just do this on Ethereum or Solana? Can you, before we unpack some of the specific design principles of Anoma and what that actually is, can you help us understand what are some of the things that might be invisible today that you see as a massive problem or ma major design decisions that we might have made that are incorrect? Um, can, you, can you point some of those out? Because I think it'll help contrast when we sort of unpack your vision of the future. Mm -hmm. So at a very high level, I think a lot of the progress in blockchain design has come from a sort of unbundling of components. Um, originally with Bitcoin, Bitcoin started with everything integrated. There was literally one piece of software written by, you know, we think one guy or girl or small coordinated group. Um, and that piece of software did everything. It had an asset, it did ordering, it did storage, it did execution, it did verification, um, all in one sort of glob without clear boundaries between any of these things. Now, over time, we've seen, you know, those aspects start to become unbundled, uh, with certainly with kind of the roll-up centric direction of Ethereum with different aspects of modular design. Um, but I still think there are some assumptions baked in that may not be suitable for the design context. Um, one of those relates to the design of virtual machines. So most virtual machines in blockchains, at least that I know of, are built on something called the von Neumann architecture. So this is true of the Ethereum virtual machine. It's true of the Solana virtual machine. It's true of the message passing system between Cosmos modules, which is a little bit like a virtual machine. Um, von Neumann architectures are, are uh, pretty old. They date from the 60s. And they were designed, I think, primarily for mainframe computers. Um, and they worked, you know, they were designed for people to execute programs, do computations using computers. So they already had some aspects which are relevant to blockchains. They had maybe multiple parties using the computer, um, but they did not necessarily have, they, what they did not have was distribution. In particular, they had one, you know, one unique clock 
And one of the things, one of the assumptions baked into this architecture is the idea that there's like a single place where ordering happens. And this is not true in the blockchain context. There are a lot of places where ordering happens. This is in fact where like MEV comes from, is that there's not just a single place where ordering happens. Um, and uh, this uh, kind of, you know, for example, in some of our work with Anoma, we are working on what we call a resource machine, which is kind of like a virtual machine that doesn't make this assumption. Um, it as assumes that there can be multiple stages of ordering, where each stage of ordering is kind of like the partial application of a state transition. And at the end, you better get one that's fully applied. So one, I guess, uh, maybe blind spot that I would see is just this um, virtual machine design that's based on a kind of logically centralized execution context uh, of a mainframe computer. The blockchains don't have that. Um, another concept, you know, certainly the concept of privacy has become pretty salient in recent years. Um, personally, I think the word privacy is kind of misleading as it pertains to blockchain systems for two reasons. One, privacy is not a system property. It's a property of a specific interaction. So if we think of a transaction, I might make my transaction public to you, Hart, but not to you, Mike. Uh, so is that transaction private? Well, it's, it's sort of, it's both private and not private, right? It's like private to one person, public to the other person. Um, so it's not really a property. It's, more, it's a property of a specific you know, piece of data with respect to a specific observer, not of like a system, right? Um, also, I think privacy has this connotation of hiding. It's like it's 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 comes from this world where light is bouncing around everywhere. And if you don't want light to bounce on your thing, you know, if you don't want your neighbors to see what you're doing, you have to pull down the window blinds. So there's this like implication of an act of hiding. And this is not not how digital systems work, at least not how these kinds of distributed systems work. You know, by default, your data lives on your computer. And the only way it goes somewhere else is if you like send it somewhere else. So the thing that we're really trying to program is disclosure, not privacy. Um, now, a limitation of some existing systems uh, is that they couple these decisions. So if you use a fully transparent chain, like the Ethereum main chain at the moment, Solana main chain at the moment, um, you can only choose to disclose your transaction to everybody or nobody, right? If you don't send it to the blockchain, it's private, but it's also not very useful. And if you send it to the blockchain, all of the data is visible to everybody. So that is a kind of programmable disclosure. It's just a very limited kind. And uh, what we're trying to work on at Anoma with the resource machine is uh, to allow for much more fine-grained distinctions using, among other things, zero-knowledge proofs, where users can select specific parties who they want to see specific parts of their transaction data, which is, you know, how most people are used to interacting in the real world anyway, right? You have like a lot of chat groups and they have different partially overlapping intersections of people and different purposes, and you share, you know, different information in them depending on contexts. And I think that's also the direction we might expect uh, blockchain systems to evolve. Yeah, Chris, there's so much to unpack there. So one um, one concept that I might point listeners to as well is this idea of uh, skeuomorphism, which might be relevant here. Chris Dixon has talked about this at length, but maybe one difference um, for listeners, you know, when when we've talked about building operating operating systems in the past, it's kind of like here's the software you you know log onto your computer and then it's just there. Whereas what we're talking about here, I think, is building a distributed operating system here. So there are some principles that apply and some that don't necessarily. But where I really want to dig in is this concept of unbundling, which is frankly a core uh, core theme of this season. And I think people are only starting to understand. And where I want to to maybe end up in this discussion is especially most people who are listening will be familiar with this idea of modularity as unbundling settlement from DA from uh, consensus and execution. I think people are pretty familiar with that as a mental model. But I think the thing that folks are only starting to grapple with is unbundling like a protocol from its asset, from its security model. And you have talked about competition, you know, from the standpoint of a protocol competing with an asset. And I would love to kind of unpack the, the vectors of competition there. But even before we get there, you have this really great analogy of us malappropriating ideas and business models from Silicon Valley. Um, and you kind of talked about us maybe having this mental model of platforms as the primary vehicle for value capture and SaaS. So can, can you, even before we get into that unpacking, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the preconceptions that we might have for how uh, value is extracted on the internet and that are kind of taken for granted in Silicon Valley 
and how we have misappropriated that within a blockchain context. Mm -hmm. So I think a pretty common model of how value is accrued in um, Silicon sort of in Web2 companies mostly is this concept of a platform and a platform uh, seeking and deriving value from usage and fees that are associated with usage. So a few canonical examples of this are something like um, Uber, something like the App Store, something like even, you know, um, on like Facebook marketplace, stuff like this. Um, in all of these cases, there's a basic theory of proportionality in play. The theory that like the value of the platform is proportional to the amount of usage. And that's usually directly true in these cases because all of the usage pays like fees to the platform, right? Um, and often this model, you know, it seems to me in the, in the discourse is uh, applied to um, blockchains and their assets, as in there's like a theory that the value of an asset is proportional to the value of usage fees paid on the platform, and in particular, the value of like applications directly running on or perhaps even deriving security from that platform. Um, but a critical, there are a few critical differences between what happens in Web2 and what's happening on blockchains. One of them is that there's a distinct asset. So, you know, uh, the Facebook App Store or uh, Google um, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, sorry, uh, Google and Apple's uh, stores on their respective platforms, um, they don't have their own currency. Now they might want to issue a currency. Facebook did try to do this, uh, but but they're too big and they're too anti-trusted to um, manage that and perhaps too badly coordinated internally, whatever, I don't know. But uh, they're still, they're using a different currency. So they're, you know, I think the platform like thesis of value for Web2 companies is like pretty much correct. Like the value, uh, you know, whether or not it's good for society, it's like correct for analyzing what's going on in that set of value flows. But Bitcoin and Ethereum, Cosmos, Solana, uh, these ecosystems have native assets and those assets can be used. And, you know, uh, I mean, basically the value of an asset is like uh, not determined by anything other than who chooses to buy and use that asset. There's no, I don't think you can reduce it to some like physical law or some usage of a platform or something like this. Assets can live in many different places. And at least I would say, you know, to me, the primary value of these assets, let's say, for example, Ethereum really comes from the community and people wanting to be part of the community, people finding the services provided by that community valuable, people choosing to invest in uh, the asset, to accept the asset, you know, really to kind of demonstrate um, and increase their alignment with the community. Um, so I think... This model is kind of, you know, if maybe just accept that as a hypothesis, then this platform value capture model is not particularly synergistic if the actual value capture mechanism is the community. Because the platform value capture model tends to lead to this kind of attempt to create usage, right? Um, you see this more in new ecosystems uh, than, than directly in Ethereum, although you saw it more on Ethereum initially where a bunch of the issuance of the asset is used to kind of encourage applications to just use the platform. And in order to qualify for that issuance, the applications have to like, I don't know, pay fees to the platform or inherit security from the platform or something like this. Um, and I'm not sure that that's, I think that's maybe not the most efficient use of capital if the primary value of the asset is derived from the community, not the platform. If the primary value of the asset is derived from the community, then you want to like make the community better make it a, a community that provides more value, you know, provides more education, make it a community that more people want to join and invest into the future of um, stuff like this. What's up everyone. We are now almost one month out from DAS London, the largest institutional conference in all of crypto. That's happening March 18th through the 20th, obviously in London. This one's gonna be a blast. We are almost 10 times oversubscribed for tickets, which is pretty nuts. So again, we've had to lower the discount to Bell 10, still hooking you guys up, giving you a 10% discount on Bell 10. And we've onboarded a whole bunch of new speakers. So that's Dan Tapiero of 1RT, Pascal Gauthier of Ledger, Anthony Scaramucci, the Mooch himself, Michael Sonnenschein of Grayscale, Brad Garlinghouse of Ripple, Sergey Nazarov of Chainlink, Matt McDermott of Goldman Sachs, their global head of digital assets, Stani Kulachov, Danny Masters, the list goes on. This one is going to be an absolute blast. Make sure you don't miss it. And better yet, make sure you bring your friends. We sell a four pack of tickets. You're going to get a discount on that. So find people in your company, bring your boss, bring your family, bring your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is, 
just go. You're gonna get a discount if you use that team pack. Run, don't walk. Make sure you go get those tickets today and cheers and see you in sunny London town. So Chris, like, okay, I wanna push on this and I wanna draw it back a little bit to intense and how like intense, uh, let's how intense enables or improves interop here too. But to regurgitate a little bit of what you're saying here, let's just to make two examples. We have like the Ethereum platform and the Solana platform, right? And um, mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm gonna frame them as Web2 businesses, which they're not, but let, just bear with me for a second. So we have Ethereum platform and Solana platform and this kind of platform value capture model. We're saying, hey, um, uh, users, go use the Ethereum platform, do things exactly this way. Here's how Ethereum execution works. Here's what an Ethereum transaction looks like. Uh, you use Ethereum to pay for it. And at the end of the day, um, in this particular framing, we're going to say this looks like a Web2 value capture business. We want more usage of our platform. Um, it's good for the asset, right? Um, and on Solana, you have the same thing. It's just different um, uh, infrastructure. It's different, different opcodes, different uh, execution environment. Here's your Solana transaction. Here's how it works. Go, let's use Solana, capture value that way. Um, and as I've been reading and even prepping for this with you, we're like, okay, these two things make sense, um, but you're making a couple interesting points here. One point is the actual user, and I'm going to use the word user and make it more singular. You're kind of talking about communities, which are maybe more pluralistic, but like the user, from their perspective, they don't really care if they're using the Ethereum platform or the Solana platform. They just care if they can do the thing they want to do. Like, whatever the action is they want to do. And maybe I'll pause here and let you kind of go into intents and how you see intents as a method to unify uh, these different platforms. Right. I mean, to your point, um, you know, I think as protocol architects or as a protocol architect, my job is to be humble and accept that users want things and I have no influence over it. And users don't want to like use a particular, I don't know, blockchain. It's like, you know, think, think about computers. Do you want to use like the Intel, you know, i7 processor because you have a specific affinity to that particular processor? Maybe if you were like the designer of that processor or you're like the dad of the person who designed the processor, maybe it has a special, you know, significance in your life. But for most people, they want to use the processor because it's like faster or because it has more cash lines. Like they don't care about the specific thing. They care about what it provides to them. Um, and, you know, intents in our conception are a way for users to describe what they want the blockchains to provide to them and what they want the other users to provide to them in a court in the course of a multi-party interaction. So with. Well, uh, uh, yeah, let me go deep. Let me lead you or let's lead our audience into like a more technical understanding of why that's true. Right. So let's let's keep going with this. Uh, and we talked about this uh on Monday a little bit in the, in the preview or the prep for this, but um, let's, let's go with the computer processor analogy. Cause I think, think it's quite useful. Um, and we're going to say uh, the Ethereum is a computer processor and maybe some, um, some listeners will know like the difference between like risk and CISC architectures. These are like different op codes for how computer processors work. Um, and let's just say Ethereum is like one set of computer. It's like the risk computer processor. Here are the op codes. Here's how this processor works. And Solana is the CISC processor. Here are the opcodes. Here has, here's how this processor works. And um, in order to do a computation, you can do computations on both systems. They absolutely work. But literally, the opcodes you're using to do the computation are different. And at the end, you can run your computation and get your output at the end. And um, my mental model for what you're doing with Intense here is you're saying, I don't care how the copy computation works. I care about the output. I care about the thing at the end. And so I can define an uh, uh, a constraint, an instruction set. You can probably, I can mathematically define the state transition that I want to have happen as an intent with like an output. And then I can run and verify that that intent was fulfilled on any execution set, on any processor. And I don't care how that happens. First of all, do you agree with that? Technically, what's wrong with that? Um, and yeah, we're, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the user in writing an intent, at least in the way we define it, 
defines basically what properties they want the computation to have. So those could be a specific output. Those could be a relation between input and output. They could be like, it, it's the user is purposefully less specific. So with a transaction, you say, I want the CPU to execute instruction 10, then instruction 12, then instruction 34, then instruction 40, and then it's done. And with an intent, you say, I want the relationship between the input and the output of the transaction to be that like my balance increases by at least six. Right. And you don't care whether that happens with instructions. I forgot now which ones I said, but 10, 20, 34, and 40, or like 52 and 65, as long as the uh, resulting state, basically, which is the only thing you could verify anyways, um, satisfies the properties that you described in your intent. So just, just to underscore that point, like for me, this makes this intent architecture or this model uh, a no brainer for a lot of interoperability. Because like, if I want to run on different processors, if I want to run on different types of execution environments, um, I don't want to have to define different instruction sets, like you just said. I don't want it to be like, you know, instruction 4, 34, 40 on one system and 24 and just completely different on this other system. I just want to define what I'm trying to do and then it can go and get executed wherever. And so I do think when I've been reading or listening to your stuff, there is this obviousness to me that this uh, less prescriptive way of what I'm trying of defining what I'm trying to do enables this modular multi-chain world um, because I can define one thing that can get executed anywhere. Um, agreed? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, there's still difference in the, to take the analogy of CPUs, which I think is pretty good. Um, there are still differences in CPUs, like if, um, you know, over time CPU architectures change and for specific programs, different CPUs might be more or less efficient. There is a relationship there. You can't like completely abstract it. Um, but still, I think that in the context of um, intense um, and kind of intense flowing around all of these different, you know, modularized, abstracted blockchains, um, users are going to be delegating or kind of expressing most of what they want, most of their preferences for selection of particular CPUs in the intents just as properties. So in my intent, I might say that I want you know, best price execution defined in such and such a way, fairness defined in such and such a way. And I want like these assets, you know, I'd better name the exact assets I want, but maybe I'm fine with Solana or Ethereum or Cosmos, like those all have enough security for me. Um, and maybe I don't, you know, I don't even care. Like, I don't care where the assets were initially. I just care that they get to the place I want them by the time my intent is settled. So there will be some like market in some sense. It's like if you had an operating system on your computer where your computer had a bunch of CPUs that were competing with each other to run your computations and you as the person writing the program said, okay, I will give my computation to like the CPU, which satisfies my properties and uses the least energy or something like this. Um, and in, you know, your computer doesn't do that because it doesn't have an internal economic system, at least not yet, uh, but blockchains do so they can. Yeah. I guess to be really concrete, right. You, you are right. You're adding in the processor analogy breaks down because there aren't really trust assumptions on your different processors. They like, are just they work right um whereas you're saying with a blockchain system there are trust assumptions and so i could define my intent but i can also be granular and specific about which processors aka trust assumptions i'm okay with and like uh to pick on tron i can say hey i'm okay executing this everywhere but tron i just don't like it for whatever reason yeah yep that's right so okay so that to me um yeah, that's that's super cool. And we now have this, maybe for a second, we can talk about how um, the, the in, this sort of solver network concept. So once we have intents um, and we're saying users can specify the thing they wanna do without specifying the processor, AKA blockchain system um, that it's gonna be done on, although they have granular preferences to pick which ones they like. Um, then the idea here is you have uh, a network of permissionless decentralized actors that you call solvers that effectively compete to uh, execute or fulfill their intent. Uh, do, do you like expand on that for a second? 
Yeah, that's the idea. So the way um, Anoma segments the world of applications. Um, we think that mostly users are using applications in the distributed systems blockchain context because they want to coordinate with other users. And coordination with other users almost always has two phases, which we call counterparty discovery and settlement. And counterparty discovery is the process of figuring out who is a suitable counterparty given what I want to do with my intent. So if I want to trade uh, ETH for USDC, I'm looking for a counterparty who wants to trade USDC for ETH. Very simple. The second phase is settlement. Settlement is posting that transaction once we've agreed on it, once I found a counterparty and someone has, um, you know, perhaps me or a solver has made the transaction. A settlement is posting that transaction somewhere where it can be ordered, at least with respect to relevant state, so that everyone can verify that that transaction and not some other transaction actually happened. Um, and in our world, solvers facilitate counterparty discovery. So you could, you don't need always solvers. You could just do counterparty discovery by sending each other messages on Signal or Twitter or something. We've seen a little bit of this in the wild, in particular with NFT trading. There was some counterparty discovery happening on Signal, uh, on Twitter and some Telegram groups. Um, I saw some of that. Um, but for the most part, users would like, like computational uh, counterparty discovery is a lot of computational work. You know, you have to like message all of these people on Twitter and see if they want to buy your NFT or not. And it would be great if someone could um, kind of do that computational work for you and keep a track of a whole bunch of intents and figure out when some of them could be matched to figure out what like the available liquidity is. And in our conception, this role is called a solver. So solvers are both, they're handling a lot of intents. Many intents will never become transactions because there is no suitable counterparty. Um, but solvers are handling a lot of intents, figuring out when intents can be matched, crafting transactions to do that, and sending those transactions uh, to chains or consensus providers for settlement. Uh, Chris, I've, I've got a question for you about, um, you know, something that I've heard you discuss quite a bit, which is this idea of flow control or standards. Um, and I, and I want to start to lead this into that, like, how is this better from intents as they're instantiated today in, for instance, something like Uniswap X or CalSwap? And I, I think the answer to that kind of lies in this idea of standards um, and the amount that like a, a user can kind of granularly dictate preferences across this network of searchers. So can you say a little bit about the idea of standards within this world that you're describing? Right. So, I mean, intents are, are in many ways, maybe a, just a word that has become more popular rather than like something new that has come into existence, you know, maybe word and concept. Um, but they've, they're around, as you mentioned already, they've been around for a long time. Um, all the way, I would say all the way back to like, what was it? Ether Delta was one of the original Ethereum DEXs that used something which looked a little bit like intents, of course, a very specific kind. And now you have a lot of uh, what I would call sort of distinct, um, uh, sometimes they're called off-chain or, or kind of separate intent systems, application specific intent systems for Uniswap X, for CowSwap, um, for OpenSea, I would describe as this kind of thing. Um, different NFT trading protocols, um, different sort of order book based fungible asset exchange protocols. Um, and those are um, one, those are those are fine and it's clear that users want intents. But one disadvantage of having many different protocols is that uh, they're not very interoperable. And users typically have to pick one when they're doing some kind of application interaction. So a user has to choose to send their order to Uniswap X or choose to send their order to CowSwap or choose to send their order to you know, OpenSea or whatever. And uh, typically that means that users will get a worse price just because like less liquidity is immediately available. Now, to some extent, solvers which understand like multiple protocols can maybe bridge things, but it also depends on how the intent system is built. Uh, some of them, you know, may not allow settlement with like other things included in the transaction atomically or something like this. Um, so there's a lot of friction um, that I think is is unnecessary. If you have um, intent level composability, then users can just send like it's like there's just there's one giant pool of intents sort of conceptually. The pool is it doesn't exist all in one central location. It's split up across solvers across this network. But uh, you can reroute intents over time to like put the intents which are most likely to related to be related to the other intents in similar places. So you could do this kind of locality optimization and do that on the basis of what state intents actually want to touch, right? And that should in the end lead to better prices for users. 
So like specifically, just to make this super concrete, right? I have my swap from X to Y, from USDC to ETH. Um, I could send that intent to Uniswap X or to CalSwap or to One Inch Fusion. I'll just use really concrete examples. Um, but I'm basically constraining the space and who can fill that intent to a specific application, even though they're all doing conceptually the same thing. And what would be really nice would be, uh, and, and that's worse for me, I get worse price execution because there's less competition to fill my order um, from this solver network. So what I want is a standard where I define it once, um, I define my intent of what I want to do, and anyone that can, any application that can fulfill that intent can go ahead and fill it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I also think, it, I mean, this is maybe a, a sort of more marginal difference, but it takes a lot of work to build an intent system like Uniswap X, CowSwap, OpenSea. These are big, well-funded teams. Most independent DAP hackathon developers cannot build and run like an intent system. Um, and I think that just limits the supply of applications. Um, and standardizing more of the protocols means that you don't have to write like all of this off-chain sort of application specific solver infrastructure anymore. You don't have to convince all of these like market makers to use your bespoke protocol um, if you're using a standard. So I agree with that fully. Um, and it, so, you know, I don't know how much we talked about this, but I, I have this uh, intent-based cross-chain bridge. Um, so I'm like very, Chris, I don't even know. I'm like an intense maximalist. So this is like all, uh, all, all kind of, kind of fun for me. But the thing that I think is worth pushing on, pushing you on is like why intense, the examples we just had are all single chain, mostly single chain examples where I'm like doing a swap on in our cow swap one inch, um, you know, swap X it's on Ethereum. But, um, I think you have a lot of views on why intense help interop or uh, moving between chains or bridging the gaps between chains. And I, I think it'd be really useful to get your perspective and your insights as to why intents uh, work better or maybe even are required um, in some of these uh, multi-chain environments. Yeah, so I think it's, it's helpful to frame like what is going on if you consider the whole ecosystem as one network. So if you consider the whole ecosystem as one to be one network, you know, users are submitting intents all of the time. They're already doing this. Transactions are intense. They're just like more specifically limited because you force the execution path to be instruction 10, then 40, then 32. Um, so users are already submitting intents all of the time. Then these intents are getting kind of sorted and routed around um, and matched and settled somewhere. And to me, this is really a scheduling problem. As in, if users, now if users have specific trust affinity, you know, if there's like one class of users who only wants to use Ethereum and a completely disjoint class of users who only wants to use Cosmos and they never want to interact with each other, you know, then you don't need a cross-chain intent system. But that is not the world we observe. We observe a world where people want to interact with each other and they want to move assets around and they want to like coordinate with all of these other ecosystems. Uh, and I think that's great, but it means that when we look at like, oh, let's imagine so that we're at time step, you know, one in the giant intense network. And we have a whole bunch of intents. And those intents have different preferences as to where they can be settled and what they're looking for. So one intent might say, you know, Cosmos or Ethereum or Solana. Another intent might say, you know, must be Ethereum. Another intent might say Solana or Cosmos, right? And they are looking for different assets. And so just to like maximize throughput, we want to kind of schedule these intents on different, um, you know, different solvers and different execution backends so that we uh, get everyone the assets they want and like don't, it's like, it's like a parallel scheduling problem. Like you don't want to send all of your transactions to a one core database if they don't need to touch the same state. Um, so, you know, to us one, maybe this is a different, a different, and someone you could understand this is like a different view on scaling than sort of modular or monolithic. Uh, modular and monolithic are both focused on scaling like one logical domain in some sense, you know, maybe a security domain, uh, you know, certainly in the case of a monolithic system, it's like an everything domain. In the case of a modular system, it's, you know, at least one logical security domain. Um, and, uh, you know, I think both of those approaches are valuable, uh, but we need something else. And to me, that is like a, a, a scaling system that considers the scheduling problem of figuring out which intents need to be routed to which domains, you know, dynamically all of the time based on what users' preferences actually are. 
one thing as well, Chris, I think is is worth you know pointing out for the listener. If we can maybe even just like telescope out for a second here and try to summarize what we're discussing. What we're discussing is again, if you had this viewpoint of you know I live my life on Ethereum versus Solana versus Cosmos, what we're talking about is a future where you could consider those trust zones or you know different networks of compute or whatever it is. And if you have to imagine, if you're a five-year-old like me and you need to imagine things actually in space, consider them like these little concentric circles, right? And they're all like kind of bumping up and maybe there's like a bigger Venn diagram over some circles. Some circles are completely separate, right? And that's like what we've, so we've got all these circles that are like kind of touching. And what we're talking about is moving up, we're abstracting a layer to this intense sort of layer where there's counterparty discovery and there's a, a, a set of shared standards that all of these different uh, programs sort of plug into and users can dictate their preferences to this network of little hornets or worker bees or whatever that take these desires off to different networks and then they kind of get routed and executed. And I think that's what you're talking about with the scheduler problem. What you're describing is a system which is very accommodative of heterogeneity. We are assuming that there are going to be multiple different sets of logic security models, different types of assets, different user preferences, all that stuff. And I'm wondering how much of what we're describing here is a technical problem versus a social problem. And what I mean by that is like, if you, again, now telescope back in as, as where this is broken today, it's probably on Ethereum rollup land where we fragmented uh, liquidity and uh, users across different chains that don't interoperate with one another. And it's my strong suspicion that that's not a technical problem, that that's a social problem. And each one of these platforms don't have a strong incentive to actually build something like IBC in between. Because, again, they wouldn't say this, but it is my strong suspicion. They're like, well, we could accommodate for heterogeneity, right? We could be like, yeah, there's going to be arbitrum and optimism, et cetera. But I bet what each of these things are thinking is, I'm just going to scale so large that it's just going to be one homogenous block space, and then it's going to work really well within my ecosystem. And so my question to you is, do you agree with that broad characterization of heterogeneous versus homogenous? And how, you know, how tactically do we get these applications to agree to this shared set of standards? Because that seems to be the big challenge from, from where I sit. Right. Um... Yeah, I, 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 that that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I think I would also tie this to the platform value capture thesis. I think people think that there's not a lot of value in building interoperability protocols, protocols which allow other people to like use different assets and different systems and different domains because it's like it's not their platform, uh, and they think that they'll you know uh, accrue more value by just getting more people to use specifically their platform where their platform is understood as like their roll up their L1 chain, like a specific trust domain, right? Um, you know, there is a great, I forget who said it, so maybe someone could find this in the comments, but there's a great law, uh, law of software architecture and organizational design that the architecture of your software will always mirror the architecture of your organizations. And, you know, in Ethereum, the Ethereum rollup land is full of like, I think largely well-meaning, but definitely fragmented organizations. And the Ethereum rollup protocols are perhaps largely well-meaning, but definitely fragmented. Um, so I think it's difficult to, you know, uh, as, as you put, no one at least feels like they have an individual incentive to do it. And the organizations are fragmented. So the protocols will mirror that. Yeah. So I, I want to, one more concept that I want to make sure that we cover, because I do want to unpack, I think this is, this will be a concept that many listeners haven't you know, explicitly thought about, which is, again, this is kind of one of those assumptions that you didn't even realize that you were making that, of course, the value of ETH, the asset is going to be dependent on the functionality and utility of Ethereum, the network. And I actually still have some questions, even hearing you describe, you know, separating these two as distinct concepts and different arenas for competition. I still, even in this routing example, like, I still feel like Ethereum has successfully gated its trust zone with with ether the asset right to to gain access to you know the security set or whatever of ethereum i feel like you still need to use ether token so i still have some questions for you on that but before we get there i do want to cover the last you know bit of architecture here which feels important which is the existence of zero knowledge proofs 
and how that has like eliminated a massive technical barrier for getting these very different systems to speak to one another. So can, can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So just talking here about kind of protocols like the EVM, SVM, even the Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin does have a virtual machine. It doesn't get enough credit, um, limited, but it, do, it does. You can do a lot of scripting. It's having a comeback. Um, it's having a comeback. Is it? Is it? Okay, great. <laughs> I'm not, maybe not tuned in, but um, these protocols are basically defined by their verification functions, because this is what you need to know in order to verify the history of a blockchain, in order to run a node in order to operate in this distributed context. And those verification functions, you know, just to run computationally are very expensive. If you want to verify the history of Bitcoin, you have to replay all Bitcoin transactions from Genesis, same for Ethereum. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, ver that cost uh, t can limit interoperability between different protocols because different protocols, you know, if you're running your transaction on the Bitcoin chain, that chain, because the validators who are running it have already done those computations, that chain already knows, like the current Bitcoin state, it's already implicitly verified that history. Uh, same for Ethereum. But if you want to, say, use the Ethereum state on Bitcoin, uh, you know, someone, you, you need to like, it's, I mean, you could just try and convince all the Bitcoin full nodes to also run Ethereum. Like that would work if you could do it. Um, but it's difficult because running Ethereum is very is expensive. So all those nodes now have to replay all the Ethereum transactions and verify them as they continue coming along. So in some sense, you're like your verification cost is the same cost as it was to run the transactions in the first place. Um, with zero knowledge proofs, and here it's really not the zero knowledge part that's doing the work, but rather the succinct part. Um, once you do a computation, you can someone can create a proof, which is like a few a few orders of magnitude overhead still, but it's getting lower. I think it's like ten to the third. Um, at the moment. Um, and then anyone can verify that computation in constant cost, O of 1, even for a very long, you know, eventually for a very long history, like history of Ethereum or Bitcoin. And this, I think, really changes the calculus of protocol competition and interoperability. Because before these kinds of succinct proofs, you know, if you, you could choose, if you uh, wanted to run a transaction, you really have to choose like either the Bitcoin history to run it on top of or the Ethereum history. You can't do both. The cost is too high. But with zero knowledge proofs, as soon as any changes are made on any one of these systems, a proof can be sent anywhere, right? So think of like, also think of like a zero knowledge rollup, which is using also the succinct part, not the zero knowledge part, uh, typically. Um, these zero knowledge rollups, sometimes we think of them as being related to a particular chain. Like we might think of them as being L2s of Ethereum or L2s of Solana, something like this. Um, but really intrinsically they aren't. Once you do the computations and produce a proof, that proof can be verified anywhere. Um, and the ability to create these kinds of proofs, which can be verified so cheaply, I think just makes it much cheaper for different protocols to interoperate with each other, right? As long as you know you have to pay some computational overhead costs to create the proofs, but once you have them, you can verify them anywhere else with a few elliptic curve multiplications or some hash functions. Um, so I think that will have some interesting implications. Yeah, Chris, I want to like uh, hammer hammer in and underscore a lot of this because it was a big conceptual uh, unlock for me, and I think this is really freaking cool. Um, so I'm going to relate back to just to help all the audience understand this like we go back to our processor analogy so you have like the uh, ethereum processor and the solana processor right and um you can kind of think back about um you know some of us maybe a little bit older like emulated old computer games on processors right it was possible to construct the like nintendo architecture on your x86 machine and you could emulate it but everybody knew it was kind of expensive, right? Because you're sort of doing this, like a lot of extra work to do this emulation thing. And I think the analogy here, if I'm understanding you correctly, is like, um, you know, Solana, uh, the Solana processor could completely trustlessly emulate Ethereum if it replayed the eth entire Ethereum uh, blockchain history all the way up to the, the tip of the chain. Um, you could do that. And Solana is a powerful machine. It could probably do that, but it would take up a lot of resources. And it's obviously a lot of work to do that. Um, and what you're saying here is, yeah, these protocols can theoretically emulate each other or verify each other. Um, but the succinct property of zero knowledge proofs lets them do this much, much, much more efficiently. Um, 
And then maybe it's worth underscoring what this succinct property of zero knowledge proofs really means here. What it means is that uh, we're not talking about privacy at all. What we're talking about is compressing a whole bunch of computation into something that is easy to, to prove. So I could say, I could generate a zero knowledge proof for the current state of the Ethereum blockchain. And um, it would be like O of N, like one computation um, or linear time computation, not even linear time, one computation to verify this compared to actually replaying all of the Ethereum history. And so, yeah, for me, I want to like, I kind of jump up and down at this idea. I think it's just super cool that the succinct property of zero knowledge proofs allows us to communicate between complicated protocols in uh, like O of one complexity time very efficiently. And that is conceptually a very cool way to think about interoperability. First of all, did I get that right? Correct me like where I'm technically wrong or, or, or anything. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think maybe there are like uh, two um, distinctions from the case of emulation. So I, I used to have a, oh my God, it's like a Windows Mobile 2002 pocket PC. And I managed to run a Game Boy Color emulator. Because I got it for free because I was like 10 and dirt poor. And I managed to run a Game Boy Color emulator and played Pokemon Crystal on the emulator at about 15 frames per second. Now, there are two differences between that situation and what we're, what's going on here. One is that in that emulation, I actually wanted to do the computation. Like I needed to compute, you know, what the result of the Pokemon battle was. Um, and in the case of blockchains, we're not trying to do the Ethereum computations on Solana or do the Solana computations on Ethereum. We're only trying to verify the computations that have already happened. So the thing that we're emulating is the verification, right? Not the original computation. And then the second difference is that this, these succinct proofs allow us to do that verification in O of 1 instead of O of N. Whereas previously, before succinct proofs, verification was like the same thing as computation. In order to verify, you had to redo the computation. Now you don't. And that's an order of, you know, just like a order of, I don't know, order of infinity level difference. It's a many order of magnitude improvement for how these otherwise complex protocols can talk to each other. And that, um, yeah, seems really cool. Period. Yeah, I, I'm. And and for those who uh, are slightly less, you know, technical minded, can you just give an, an overview, Chris, as well of like why, you know, I generally, you know, from what I know about um, these sorts of proofs, I mean, they just represent such a massive improvement um, to how like interop might work today. Like, what what is the reason these things haven't been fully implemented yet, and like, what are kind of some of the major issues like i guess i'm even just wondering in like a a sort of a cross-chain transaction like how quickly does the proof need to get generated in order to do something that looks like atomic composability across multiple chains would be like immediately where my mind goes but walk me through what some of the initial holdups are and then we can kind of end on this idea of you know the asset first protocol we've been talking about right that's a good question i mean i agree that proof generation latency matters a lot for interoperability but um, proof generation latency corresponds to the cost of compute and the built-in latency bottleneck in blockchain systems corresponds to the speed of light. And one of those numbers goes down over time and the other doesn't. So I think we'll probably be okay, at least given enough time. Um, why has it taken so long to deploy these systems? I, I, I think it's actually going pretty quickly. Like blockchains are distributed systems. They're hard to change. Plus they, they you know, maybe one reason it's slow is that there tends to be a lot of like at least nominally US dollar value flowing around in these systems. So people are hesitant to deploy untested cryptography as they should be. Um, you know, I also there's a lot of the zero knowledge field was really pulled, especially by Zcash from like theory into practice in a very short time. And there's still a lot of innovation going on. And we don't have, you know, uh, like we aren't trying to standardize a single zero knowledge proof um, system, right? Because there's still so much innovation happening. Um, we're trying to standardize things in an at a higher of like compiler level, compiler level. So I think uh, a lot of the stuff will get deployed over time. It just takes time. Mike, can I get one more technical question in here before we go into the um, protocol asset stuff? Um, and, and Chris, like, keep this short, I think. But um, I am still curious how Anoma enables like uh, cross chain settlement. Like, how does that conceptually work? If I, and just to give you an example, my intent here is sell asset on chain A, make it Ethereum. Um, 
uh, or I want to, yeah, I want to bridge asset from Ethereum to Solana. Like, let's just say, how, how do the solvers, solvers will compete to do that, but how does Enoma enable um, this cross-chain settlement? Right. Um, so to be clear, there's sort of no magic bullets and you still, you know, uh, in a consensus system, you still have to run a transaction. Any piece of state has to be owned by like a specific consensus quorum. So we can't like magically do atomic settlement across completely different chains. Um, but Enoma can do a few things that should make users' lives easier. One is just the more declarative nature. So users can specify what they want in their intent, what asset they want on which chain. And sometimes there may be multiple steps involved in actually getting the asset there, but the user specifies what they're willing to give. And some solver can do the steps beforehand as soon as they see the intent, right? Just based on that declaration of like, if you get this asset to this chain, I will give you this other asset. And the solver can front the capital there and move the asset. So this is, this is similar, for example, to, I think, the... Uniswap V4 optimistic bridging design, something like no, this? And it's not, no, it's not. This no. is very similar to my day job. So this ah, is like, sorry. Uh, which is Uniswap and Uniswap X's cross-chain design is similar to this too. So you have right. uh, this third-party front money um, in a cross. It's the relay or the front money. Um, uh, and then you verify. So they make a loan and then you verify. This is how you emulate composability. Um, and then you verify that that loan was filled. Um, this is frankly why I'm asking the question because I'm like, did you figure out something that I didn't know about or some magic bullet here, right? But um, yeah, keep going, sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, sorry for getting the protocols wrong. Um, the, uh, that's one, you know, one thing that can happen. And Noma doesn't, uh, I suspect it's not, you know, not competitive with what you're working on. It doesn't specify a particular way of like making these loans or whatever, but just by the way intents are written, you know, solvers can kind of already do that, right? They don't need like extra, they don't need an extra protocol. Um, yeah. The other main difference is just that the scheduling is happening. So users in their intents, instead of saying, you know, uh, uh, I want, like you just can say that they're fine with having an asset on Ethereum or Solana or Cosmos. A strong example of when you would probably do this is with something like USDC. Like what matters for redemption of USDC is what Circle considers to be reality. It's not the Ethereum or Solana or Cosmos blockchains, it's like Circle. So for the most part, most users, I think, should be fine with receiving Circle on any of the chains. And if you have a bunch of intents with basically less specific constraints, in the intent pool, then um, solvers can figure out like which batches of those intents actually need to be executed atomically and send those to the right chains. Um, so that is kind of like figure it, it's, it's not solving cross chain bridging by like bridging between existing chains. It's actually figuring out what the chains are dynamically and then yep. making less bridging necessary. If that makes sense. Yep. I do love it. And yeah, I got a whole bunch more to talk to you about on that, but it's very cool. And I remain an intense maximalist. So let's go. Let's go, baby. All right, Chris, I, I want to end on on this idea of separating out uh, competition vectors for protocols versus assets. So I, I first just want to understand, you know, how in an intent centric view of the world or an intent centric topology to use your phrasing uh, unbundles these concepts because even when I think about Ethereum, the Ethereum trust zone within the context of the system that we've outlined here, I still my mental model for it is you know a searcher if the intent is hey I want to deposit ETH in Aave which is a smart contract on Ethereum you know my mental model is still like a searcher will then go essentially route and do that on your behalf but you are still like the searcher is still subject to the gating of ETH the asset to you know, access those trust assumptions and probably Aave the app itself. So can you just mechanically explain again for listeners, like how these things are getting unbundled and how this might work differently in the future? Right. So I, I, to be clear, I agree that at the moment, if you want to post a transaction to the Ethereum, like main blockchain, uh, you have to pay Ether for gas. That's just how the Ethereum protocol works. Um, now it could work differently. It could say like, um, you know, you could pay a different asset that's not Ether, but somehow it goes to Ether holders. Ethereum doesn't do that, but other chains like Cosmos do. Um, Cosmos Hub. Um, but in a world where many users are not, they're not necessarily sending their transactions to Ethereum. They might want Ethereum security eventually, 
but the ordering and the kind of application level you know, counterparty discovery matching is probably not happening on the Ethereum main chain because it's very expensive to do counterparty discovery with ETH gas prices. Um, then these users are, uh, you know, they're probably paying like some other asset or they're paying implicitly with slippage or something like this. And if they want Ethereum security, someone is paying, you know, for an Ethereum transaction eventually. Now this, this already kind of implicitly happens with sending transactions to rollups and stuff like this. Um, and the sense in which an intent center topology unbundles it is that it allows the users to make their preferences and what security they want to pay for explicit. And it gives, it kind of inverts the supply demand. So at the moment, there's a fixed specific supply of security options. There are rollups, which have different security models. There's the Ethereum main chain, which has its security model. There are other chains, Solana and Cosmos Lab, which have their security models. And users can like pick between those security models by sending their transaction to different places or by, as, as you said, by sending something to a solver that says, you know, uh, I want ETH to be deposited on Aave on the Ethereum main chain. Um, but with a sort of more general intense language, users can describe security models that don't actually exist yet like that, that no one has produced a block for, right? Users could say a signature by these validators is sufficient for my interaction because I'm trading like 50 bucks and I don't need to pay for Ethereum main chain security. And another user mm -hmm. who like wants, I don't know, is buying a, um, I don't know, small country could say, I want security of, oh, well, don't you laugh, but once the Prince of Liechtenstein tried to sell his country to um, <laughs> Bill Gates or something like that. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Uh, you um, anyway that uh, that Prince of Liechtenstein's Liechtenstein could say that he wants Ethereum and Cosmos and Solana security for this transaction, and like he's willing to pay a lot, right? Um, and then that would provide a, basically a market signal to the validators of these systems that if they sign a block which includes this transaction, like they'll all get paid, right? Uh, you can understand an Ethereum transaction as it exists today, as an intent on the peer-to-peer -peer network that just has this commitment that if you, the Ethereum validators, include this transaction by the protocol rules of Ethereum, you will get some Ether. Um, so that is already a signal. It's just like a very limited one in a more general mm. language allows for uh, users to express uh, precisely what they want. Mm. Okay, Chris, help me understand. Uh, I what One mini question for you on, you know, how do you think about restaking or shared security? Actually, now, like, there's sort of a more explicit attempt, if, whether that's uh, mesh security over in Cosmos land or interchain security, and now Ethereum restaking, even Babylon and Bitcoin. I mean, how should we understand? Is that almost like a protocol? You know, is that renting out uh, the ability to, you know, access its security model, whether it be Gasper in the case of Ethereum? Like, how do you kind of think about um, this idea of shared security within your sort of model and where that belongs in this kind of multi-chain future that we're discussing. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there is a wide variety, for example, of restaking systems and they have pretty different guarantees. So I think it might be helpful to pin down a little bit, at least in this context, how I would understand security. Um, and I would understand security as um, basically how difficult it is to revert a particular history. So when users pay for Ethereum security, they're basically paying the Ethereum validator set to agree that if the Ethereum validator set refuses to consider this transaction in its history in the future, the Ethereum validator set will like lose some amount of money or some amount of Ether in this case. Um, and different restaking protocols have different, like they have different bonding systems and different stake amounts. And so they're providing very different levels of guarantee, right? And I would say that the guarantee actually has less to do with the asset and more to do with the specifics of what is locked and what the slashing conditions are, for example, and whether there are other locks also made on the same capital. One you know, worry I have about the way restaking is happening in practice is that it's kind of fractional reserve. Like um, if you stake the same capital many different times for many different possible things you could lose it for, you don't get additive security, right? Like if several of these things happen at once, you know, uh, they don't, they all, they don't have like any more security than just the assets that you actually put up at stake. Um, so it's difficult even to reason about this independent of like, what is the application usage? Yeah. The seven Sigma event becomes a real risk now. Right. Yeah. Well, especially because it's like transparently exploitable by MBV bots. Like <laughs> instead of, instead of this being, you know, some financial markets typically sort of try to regulate these things out of existence. 
Um, and they fail anyways, but they like maintain the illusion for a few decades. At least they often do. Um, and I don't think we will have that luxury, which is probably good in the long run, but maybe chaotic. The, this is an aside, but that is an interesting point where in traditional financial markets, your seven sigma event, which happened way more often than segments of like, like five orders of magnitude more often than seven sigmas was supposed to imply. Um, you couldn't uh, model it because you didn't know the state of the world. Like it wasn't on a verifiable blockchain, but you're quite right that if you can see the state of the world and verify it all, maybe you could actually exploit or engineer a seven sigma event, which seems a little scary. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is that at least these commitments in order to work typically have to be quite public. Like if you were going to use a system, you want to know what the validators have bonded, what they have committed to when you use, for example, Ethereum, implicitly at least, you know this. Um, and that I think would allow for some more, you know, especially if the, the protocols for these kinds of commitments can be standardized, some more measurement of how much, you know, edge risk there is in the system. Um, and even, you know, for example, with intents, you could say something where uh, the validator set that you want your intent to be settled on isn't specifically identified. It's actually identified by what they have staked. So you could say, I want, you know, four validators with a combined stake of 100 ETH to sign this transaction, something like this. Um, or, and you could say that a combined stake of 100 ETH and like no commitments that conflict with blah, 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 you know, you could get more complex to try and avoid some of these problems. So that might be That's helpful. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got two closing questions for you here, Chris, which is one, listen, I wanna get your thoughts quickly on the asset side. And, and you know, what's made this more interesting for me recently is I feel like there, Bitcoin has always been explicitly, it's kind of like a money app chain, right? Like that is, their export is Bitcoin the token. And that's, that's explicitly been the goal from day one. But it feels like a bunch of other L1s recently are starting to compete on that same basis. So, you know, if, whether or not it's the ETH is ultrasound money meme, and then they've got modular money in the form of TIA. And I would just be very curious, you know, I think the mental model for a lot of listeners, maybe this is the way that they'll frame it. They talk about something like block space profitability. And they're talking about very different things. And, you know, if you're in the Ethereum camp, you'll say, look at the fees, uh, look at the fees that we generate and look at the block space profitability that should translate into more adoption of ETH, the asset. If you're on Solana, you say, hey, those fees make it unusable. And actually, you can do so much stuff over here on our protocol. Therefore, Solana should go up. They don't say that, but that's the implication, obviously, right? And what I'm hearing from you is that actually what these protocols do themselves is like much less relevant for the assets um, and their adoption. So like, can you talk a little bit about, A, like how would you view like this kind of this idea? This is a longstanding debate internally for BlockWorks about how you like the P&L sort of versions of these L1s. And then how are assets going to compete with one another as a currency or money-like asset as they're increasingly divorced from the protocol? Yeah. So first, I think just to illustrate the um, decoupling of assets and protocols, a simple example will suffice. Imagine that there are a lot of people who want to use ETH, the asset, but on Solana. As in they want to like buy Ethereum, they want to trade with Ethereum, they want to generate a whole bunch of demand for Ethereum, either asset. Um, but they want to do that on Solana because, I don't know, they like the Berkeley Packet Filter VM. Um, if you know this doesn't benefit ethereum it doesn't like generate more transaction fees on the ethereum main chain it doesn't generate more usage of the ethereum protocol it doesn't generate more solidity contracts or whatever but it clearly does generate a lot of demand for ether the asset so um i think that example is like enough to demonstrate this tension right if what you want is for ether the asset to be valuable then you should support uses of ether the asset and demand for ether the asset that is not dependent on ethereum of the blockchain um, because it helps you. And if you want to support Ethereum, the blockchain, then, uh, you know, these applications on Ethereum might pay gas fees, but they're not necessarily like you might be missing out on a whole bunch of other things that could generate demand for the asset. Um, so to talk specifically about assets in competition, um, at least my expectation is that eventually this kind of these protocols as sort of infrastructure as rails will be quite standardized and there will be many assets which users can choose from. So in other words, users will be able to choose assets and protocols independently. Like you could use Ether the asset, but you could use it with Anoma or you could use Ether the asset with Solana. 
Um, and I, I don't necessarily, you know, this may or may not be tied to the security domains, but users will be able to make those choices pretty independently. Um, and then I think the kind of differentiators of assets are really just the distribution function, like how the asset is issued to whom it is distributed um, and the community, like who holds the asset. Um, you know, users ultimately, you know, you choose to, you know, someone can give you a dollar or they can give you an ether, but you like choose whether you do something, you know, you choose whether you give them a sandwich, you choose whether you write them a report, you choose whether you, uh, you know, help them out. Um, so you're the one making the choice. And in making the choice, you can choose which assets to accept. And at least personally, I want to accept assets that are kind of like compatible with my values and things which I want to support. So, you know, by accepting Ether or by buying Ether, I'm supporting the Ethereum community and I might want to do that. Uh, so I think the, the kind of distribution and community will be the primary asset differentiators. Nice. Uh, Chris, final, final question for you to round down here. This is uh, something that Hart and I have been wondering because I think you know, if you if you almost look chronologically, if you start with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is probably the most principled crypto community, right? They have some very, very strong principles. They didn't compromise with a lot of their design. But some of the stuff that we're discussing, and this, you know, comes up around intents, like there are a lot of off-chain kind of market makers that are fulfilling these intents. And, you know, as soon as there's this tendency in crypto, I feel like as soon as you start to make something that feels like a compromise, everyone just throws their hands up and says like, well, we might as well be TradFi, you know, and and I think one of the things that we're trying to highlight is there's plenty of gray room. There's plenty of like tons of room for incremental improvement from what exists today. But maybe just in closing, you know, Chris, how would you zooming out into this like future end state of crypto, assuming that we've made some amount of compromises, what would have made the crypto experiment successful for you? Like what does success look like at the end of the adoption of crypto writ large? That's a good question. Um, I think to me, the answer would be something like crypto will be successful if we can provide an alternative infrastructure that doesn't require communities to choose between autonomy and interoperability, an alternative financial infrastructure or coordination infrastructure that doesn't require communities to choose between autonomy and interoperability. So at the moment, you really have this dichotomy where communities, even ones that want to be you know, more economically self-sufficient, must choose if they want interoperability to use like global fiat currencies. They must choose to use the dollar or the euro or the yen, you know, one of these large currencies to interoperate economically with the rest of the world. And using those currencies makes them really like dependent and subject to, you know, censorship or sanctions, which is manipulation by the very small number of centers of power that are issuing them. Um, and of course, they can choose not to use those currencies, but then they compromise interoperability. So they can retain autonomy, you know, not use any of these currencies and sacrifice interoperability, or they can retain interoperability, but sacrifice their autonomy. Um, and to me, the kind of promise, um, not yet realized, but still possible promise of crypto is to provide, a, you know, just a set of protocols that a community can run and communities can compose on each other and run with other communities that allow them to preserve both of these values, autonomy and interoperability. Man, that was a great answer. <laughs> yeah, that was a great. real cool answer. Could talk about that for a yeah. while. Yeah. Um, I actually get the feeling, Chris, we could have gone for another hour and a half here, but uh, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. This was super valuable. I think from I speak for hard here from both of our perspectives. If folks want to find out more about you or the work that you're doing at Anoma uh, or Nomada as well, like what, what's the what's the best way for folks to get more information? Uh, you can find out more about Anoma at anoma.net or Nomada at nomada.net. You can find me on Twitter sometimes at CW Ghost. Um, I, I also want to plug, we just recently released in, in public this internal peer review system we've been working on called Anoma Research Topics, which you can find at art, A-R-T dot Anoma dot net. Um, and we're trying to create kind of also a peer review system that works you know, for the needs of blockchain protocol designers would welcome a contribution to participation there. Awesome. Chris, Love it. this has been super valuable. Thank you so much for coming on. About to do it again soon. Thank you. Cheers, guys. All right. Hart, man, that was a great interview. Kind of had high hopes, honestly. That's why we put Chris as the kickoff of the season, but I think he even exceeded my expectations or hopes for going into that. What'd you think? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I was like a little bit nervous because it's like a big brain, like a really, really big brain and um, a, 
a big brain in multiple dimensions, right? There's like all this kind of like economics and philosophy, like you said at the beginning, um, there's like the economics and the philosophy and there's the technical aspects and like deep on kind of the history of computer architectures and era is, so there's a lot there. And yeah, I think he's also a very articulate guy. Um, and I legitimately, um, both in prepping for this and then going deeper with Chris, I really have some real insights that hopefully we can talk about now, um, that I think do, do impact my view of the multi-chain end game. I, I agree. Let's, let's just leave right off with that. Like you said, you had two or three, you know, before we hopped on here. So what was, you know, kind of take it, take it wherever. So, okay. Let's talk intense. Like we kind of labeled Chris as the intense guy. Um, yeah. And I, on the, on the show also said, you know, I'm an intense maximalist, which, uh, which I am, but it's mm-hmm. interesting to think about and have, um, an architecture for why this intense concept works so well. And, you know, maybe what we can do in this, this kind of, um, uh, summary bit is, is we didn't talk about like the alternative to intense. Um, and what we got into in the episode was this idea of like, okay, you have Ethereum and Solana and think of them as like different processors with, that work in different ways. Um, and one way you could communicate between the two would be write a program specific to Ethereum um, that specifically sends messages over a different protocol to Solana, and then write a program in Solana that can receive those messages and send them back to Ethereum, right? Um, and this fits within the kind of like transaction-like mindset. So now if I wanna communicate between these two protocols, I'm going to execute a transaction on Ethereum, it's gonna to get to my, my interop pro- program and it's going to send a message over another protocol to uh, Solana. My Solana program is going to receive that message, execute it, send something back. Um, and to me, I think that this is kind of the the first way people were thinking about interoperability. Like this is how we're going to connect these ecosystems. We're going to write programs native to each of their architectures and introduce another protocol uh, that communicates between those programs that are native to those architectures. And um, I, I, I think like what Chris is saying with intense is he's basically going, no, 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 wrong, wrong way, guys. Like instead, let's define the protocol at the level above, the abstraction layer above, which is the intent. What does the user want to actually do here? And that intent is going to specify constraints and the state transition and all, all that. And then I don't actually care if... Ethereum execute how Ethereum executes it or how Solana executes it. I care about where I get to at the end, and to me, that seems like such a such a powerful way of architecting or designing the system. Where you know now, if I have a third blockchain or processor, I want to slot in like Cosmos or I want to slot in um, Aptos or or Tron or whatever else. Like they all work on top of my intent layer. Whereas in the previous version I'm talking about, I'd have to build new connections between them and update my protocol to like send messages to them and all this other kind of stuff. So I think it's just a really um, powerful mental model for how to abstract interoperability and like abstract away the chains that users are are touching. I would completely, I would completely agree with you on that. And, and it feels like it, First of all, it makes for a much better, more unified user experience, but it also, my philosophy on crypto for a long time has been run every experiment, just try everything. And I think this allows, you know, within that context of flexibility, it allows different protocols to express opinions, different design decisions, and sort of compete it out. And like, ultimately that's where, you know, a, a searcher will or route something if it, if that protocol ends up producing something that's super valuable. So like I I completely agree with you on I just think it's a super powerful framework and I think Chris articulated it well in the episode. Yeah, and and I guess um, my other insight uh, I'll, I'll go like on the more philosophical bent, bent and then the last one is more on the technical side. The economics of this get really interesting too, um, yeah. and this goes into like Chris's bit about the platform economics. Um, so this is maybe less about interop, but maybe more about our multi-chain end game and where value ends up accruing. Um, yeah. So, so like, 
the Chris was really articulate with saying, hey, um, the Ethereum platform, if you think of it like a Web2 business, okay, we're going to use the Ethereum platform, write transactions that Ethereum executes, build applications on Ethereum, it uses the Ethereum asset, like ETH, 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 go, 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 go. And by the way, I don't actually think Ethereum's ethos is this way. I'm just painting this as like the, the mental model if you're trying to right. frame Ethereum as a Web2 business. And the idea of this being platform economics where the whole, all the incentives are aligned to drive the user to ETH and use ETH. And then, then it makes sense that you can kind of have an extractive, like you can charge rent to use that system. And when Chris starts talking about some of this intense stuff where, where I see it going is that he's saying, Hey, actually let's define what the user wants to do at the level above. And then you effectively can have all of these platforms compete to fill you. So Ethereum is going to compete to do the thing you want to do. Solana is going to compete. Cosmos is going to compete, whatever else. And in a sense, you're disintermediating the power of these platforms. Um, and I'm not sure I buy this or believe this yet. This is like a new thought for me. But like, if you play it out to its logical extension, he's saying, okay, users are now in control. Block space is competing to fill them. Uh, hey, block space compete to fill me best. And uh, you kind of remove a lot of the power that the platforms have um, and put it back to the user who's actually creating the intent. And that's like, again, a pretty wild thought for me. Yeah, I have so much to say on this because I've thought about it quite a bit. And it was, I had this unlock a little while ago. When you just talked, it was during the Cosmos season of the show when there was a perfect 180 degree reorientation of my worldview because when you when you hear this is kind of like you, this was articulated in the fat protocol thesis which was extremely popular at one point in time but even just the user experience that you have as a crypto person you're like okay this is the the flow as i see it probably the canonical flow how most people get onboarded i buy eth or bitcoin let's say eth because there's stuff to do eth on coinbase i then probably want to buy a token on uniswap so what I do is I take this ETH and then I, you know, I put it in my MetaMask wallet and then I have to like go to this app and it almost, it, it is a very <laughs> intuitively feels like I am in this platform and I am in this ecosystem. And most of the arguments that you hear about how value accrues in crypto is, is directly descended from Bitcoin, right? It's like 21 million hard cap, very supply based arguments and if you, the reorientation that I had was eventually there are going to be apps that have proximity to the user. And you could actually think about all of the control and leverage coming from there. Whereas there are these like kind of multiple different sets of, you know, things at the bottom of the stack, which like users might have a preference for or might not. And they're almost interchangeable with one another. And I think, I think that's why there's so much emphasis on this idea of moneyness from all of these different communities. And this idea, there was an idea, one thing that I'd love to, to get your take on is this idea of economic abstraction has been around for a long time. And I actually remember it coming up within the discussion of EIP 1559. People were really concerned about the idea of economic abstraction. And what I mean by that is there was an understanding that in order to use the Ethereum ecosystem, you had to pay validators in ETH. And the reason, the part of the reason that the burn was implemented was to get around off-chain payments. And part of that was to make it incentive compatible, right? You didn't want uh, different miners at the time colluding. But another concern was that people could make off-chain payments in something other than ETH. And so if you are making off-chain payments in something other than ETH, you have de facto removed the restrict, like the gating mechanism for ETH. And what I would point out in service of Chris's idea of these things already becoming more separate, this economic abstraction is happening. It's just happening at the layer of le the level of layer twos right now. So like a layer two, like ZK Sync that has embraced economic uh, account abstraction, you can pay gas in whatever you want. And so it is just, I think there actually is an understanding on in these different blockchains that what my protocol does, I'm using my, I'm losing my lock-in, <laughs> you know, I'm losing the ability to gate my service with my token uh, in one way, shape or form or the other. 
and therefore I my business model is to export this token. And it's just as I'm so interested in that as an idea. I find it fascinating. Mike, you are saying some sacrilege things. Like these are taboo <laughs> topics, man. I know. I I I feel like these are gonna get labeled as unaligned, but I I personally am a believer in like just say just just describe the system and then root for the best result, right? Because yeah, that probably is what everyone's trying to do. I think. No, I, I agree. And like the Ethereum community, they are intellectually honest, so I I do think that's very 100%. true. Yeah. Um, but I I think that this is again super fascinating, and this is not what I thought when, when you know you told me we we're going to do a season on the multi chain endgame. I didn't think we were going to get into like ETH economics exactly, but um. I, I do agree with you that in this multi-chain world, like, and if you really zoom out and, and think about it, um, you're saying, hey, uh, multiple chains work seamlessly and they work for the benefit of the user, not say for the benefit of Ethereum, right? Um, and if chains are working for the benefit of the user and not for the benefit of Ethereum, Ethereum in a sense is losing its lock-in um, and, uh, it becomes more commoditized um, in a sense. Now, readers listen to this, uh, or listeners, please realize I'm a huge ETH bag holder and I like Ethereum and <laughs> all that. Um, go ahead. But yeah. Actually, I think there's a really bullish argument for Ethereum here. And I, I still don't know where I fall on this, but I, I think there are two groups of people that are sort of talking past one another. There is the protocol com competition people, which is largely the Solana camp. Hey, it's really cheap to execute transactions here. And by the way, problems with Solana, like Jupiter launched today, bunch of failed transactions. Like there's still a ton of work to be done in all of these ecosystems. So none of this is in, all of this is intended as just, you know, constructive criticism. I'm rooting for everyone. But I will say, I think the the ETH people for a long time have been very concerned with the vectors of competition for ETH, the asset. And I think they're further along in this realization than the Solana camp, where they're just like, look, I'm going to do all this great stuff for the protocol and value will accrue to the token. And I think the fair pushback from the Ethereum camp has always been, I don't think those things are as correlated as you might think they are. And what I heard from Chris is that that's exactly right. And I don't know. So I feel like... If that yeah. becomes the the business model of all L1s is to export the token, then probably Ethereum. I mean, I just think Ethereum is in the best position for this personally. I agree with that, and like you know, I it's important to say the scary part out loud, right? Like, what if blockchains are more commodities than we think they are, right? Um, fine. Um, like, still, let's we're still here to build cool shit. End of the day, right? And um, mm -hmm. uh, if blockchains should be in service of what users want to do their coordination mechanisms and uh, i do think that's like what ethereum is really good at where they're intellectually honest and we want to build um the most useful smart contract platform out there um and then this multi-chain thesis is multi-chain endgame is like there is going to be competition between blockchains and that's healthy and good and everybody you have to be pretty intellectually dishonest to dislike that like there will be competition between blockchains uh, to run applications on behalf of users. Um, mm -hmm. That's good. Um, yeah. And the multi-chain world is going to make it easier for those chains to compete in a way that, like you said, really kind of a new thought there, it's reducing the vendor lock-in um, that one uh, ecosystem has. Yeah. All right. Har oh yeah. Sorry, go. Well, I was just gonna say, I got one more insight, but Mike, where are you gonna go? Yeah. I was actually going to go to, uh, I wanted to go to zero knowledge, uh, the, the proofs as a way of unifying interrupt. That, that's I was where my mind was that. going. That was where my okay, mind was cool. going. Say, say more about that because I, I feel like this is a blind spot for me, zero knowledge and proofs in general. And I'm slowly learning that I need to really up my understanding of this. And I'm almost wondering if it's worth dedicating an entire episode to because it feels like very interesting area but what were some of your takeaways from that part of the discussion so the zero knowledge stuff is always worth dedicating time to but man it makes your head hurt right like there's just some of these concepts are just hard <laughs> it's hard to wrap your head around and i'm like so it's i'm not there math. yeah it, it's true moon math but even not not even understand the math just even some of the concepts are like wait mm. how is that possible um 
uh, there's like uh, this fun uh, interactive uh, zero knowledge proof with like hats, like black hats and red hats that we can maybe have somebody talk us through uh, to yeah. that. Uh, it's um, <laughs> I think it was the Algorand founder that actually came up with this proof. But anyways, there's some really brilliant shit out there. Um, and I'm probably going to say some stuff that's wrong. And if I am wrong, people on Twitter should correct me. Um, but my unlock from what Chris said, and this I think is pretty cool. Um, let's go back to like defining a protocol, like a protocol is just a, a set of rules for how you do things. Okay. That's like one definition for it. Here's my set yeah. of rules for how I do things. Uh, there are real world protocols, which are like loosely defined, you know, like the protocol for, uh, how you order dinner, right. Uh, you know, but, and then blockchain systems. Um, and computer systems in general define protocols with deterministic rule sets. Cool. Um, you can imagine that if your protocol is a Turing complete computation environment, theoretically, um, you can run a computer program on your protocol to interpret some other protocol that is possible. Um, but it might be a lot, a lot, a lot of work, right? So specifically, I could run a protocol to verify the state of Ethereum by understanding the Ethereum execution environment, its fork choice rule, and then running through the entire history of Ethereum from Genesis to today, be like, here you go, right? And the, the thing for, I think, the listeners to kind of grok is like, yeah, you can do that. And that is so much work. That is just a ton of computation and a ton of work. To right. And then the unlock is zero knowledge proofs have two properties. They have the zero knowledge property, ignore that. They have this succinct property, which is the mm. cool part here. So we're saying what I can also do is run a zero knowledge proof proving the current state of Ethereum. So I generate this proof and today it's still pretty complicated to generate this proof, but I can generate this proof and it compresses. I think of the succinct property as a compression property. It compresses mm. all that work of like running through the rules of Ethereum through all of its history to understand the current state of Ethereum, it compresses that into this one proof. And then I can go and like verify the proof. I can look at the proof and be like through moon math, it proves all of this work through this kind of like crazy compression concept. And so the unlock I had with Chris was like, holy shit. If you can do these zero knowledge proofs that compress all the work required to verify the state of another blockchain, right? You can have protocols that would otherwise be really, really hard to like plug in together. You can kind of glue them together with the succinct property of zero knowledge proofs. And that was like a conceptual unlock for me where I'm like, wow, yeah, that makes sense. So how uh maybe Hart, could you because i understand that at a, at a high level and i actually saw i feel like i'm starting to see i know that you know zero knowledge accounts in celestia is a massive part of their roadmap i saw polygon recently introduced this thing called the ag layer which relies on zk proofs which is i, I I'm, I'm assuming that multiple different camps are starting to align on this idea how specific you know when you say you're compressing there's a it's a compression uh, technology and you're getting a view of the state like how specific is that like could you look at this one proof and somehow understand something as granular as like how much eth i have in my wallet on ethereum like how much is how much information is expressed in that line of code i mean a lot right um so let's go into like axiom um, is like they coined the term ZK Pro coprocessor, right? So it's specific to your example. Um, I want, Mike, you give me your ENS address, like mike.eth or, or .ENS or whatever. Um, and you want to know, you want to say, hey, prove to me how much ETH I have at this block height from a week ago in the Ethereum state machine, right? And Axiom has a ZK circuit that can generate a proof that shows exactly that. And that is, um, that is nuts. That is crazy to me that that's possible. That is so cool. 
yeah and again i i do think and we really do i, I really hope i'm not saying some of the zk stuff horribly wrong um but i, I do think we need uh like a, a zk person to get us even if we do this outside of the app uh, of the season just to, to to up our own knowledge here right but um um do think of it like compression so i mean in my example of the axiom proof the way you could do that without the zk proof is i just recreate i go from genesis block and know the fork choice rule and i go up to the current state of ethereum to that block height and i look at your account balance right like you get how that's possible and so for me the mental unlock is well compress that compress that yeah. with math and this math it's it's statistical in nature it's kind of like a hash function right like it's yeah. um but it's so statistically accurate you like can take it as true um and uh, uh, I can prove that statement. Um, so, so yeah, when you start thinking about, um, you know, an, another protocol, uh, Succinct. Uh, Succinct is a company that uses the succinct property of ZK proofs yeah. to um, communicate like the current state of Ethereum to other EVM chains. And they do that in a way that is like totally trustless once the proof is generated anybody can verify the proof and be like this is true or not so anyways we're not going too down on zk stuff there's like lots of other content there but zk in the context of interop and specifically this idea of protocols that could be very incompatible in how they operate like they have going back to the processor example they just have like different op codes like the way you program on them is just say very very different um you can glue them together efficiently with like ZK proofs. Um, and that, that I thought was a cool concept. I thought it was cool too. I think you're going to hear more about this as well. I, I know Vitalik loves this idea of a bulletin board for Ethereum. And he's obviously super excited about proofs in general, proof aggregation. I heard him talk at ETH CC uh, this, this past July about exactly this. And I feel like that analogy of like the bulletin board where there's an enormous amount of work that gets done in these more computationally accommodative environments, but then get sort of posted to this chain. And I don't know, I had this, it's, I guess one open question that I have, and maybe we can end on that idea that Chris gave us about what a successful, you know, you're going to get, I didn't know where Chris was going to go when he's like, what is a successful outcome? And he just had this super interesting idea of essentially removing monopolies around money and sort of control <laughs> what a great way of expressing that and uh that you know it's been a it's been sort of a question for me in general as you know if you have this mental model of the world where there will be these zones call it solana like zones maybe where there's a lot of some off-chain compute like either off-chain or in uh environments where there's on-chain computation but like higher hardware requirements for computers being done but then kind of rolling down to this extremely secure, it's kind of like security and interoperability are the two, those are the two important things from the perspective of base layer protocols. And I think you're starting to see that design in Ethereum. Uh, you're starting to see that design in Celestia. Celestia is even less performant than something like Ethereum. You can't even, it's lazy ledger, right? You can't even do smart contracts on the base layer of Celestia. And so I think that this idea of, leveraging zk proofs and having the base layer be this like very unopinionated very non-performant kind of bulletin board aggregator is probably it seems like that's the way that design is being that the design is going for major chains um but what, what did you think about that idea of it's actually going to lead perfectly into our next episode as well so i love that he ended with that but what did you think about that idea of um you know basically making it so easy so everyone can express their currency preferences and it doesn't have to, you know, we don't have to make this trade-off in between interop and autonomy. I, I love it. I think it's a wild idea and kind of like a big idea too. So um, if I'm going to regurgitate it and think about it differently, it's like uh, Chris's, the world Chris wants is a world where communities or groups of people um, have complete autonomy over how they choose to transact, how they how they choose to coordinate financially. Um, and you can think about that in different vectors. You can think about what currencies they they choose, but it can even be broader than that. Like just like what financial products and systems and services they offer, like just how they organize their financial ecosystem. Um, and 
so you give everybody autonomy, fine. Every group of people can do what they want. That part seems easy. Um, but then the hard part is like, then you connect them all. So they're actually interoperable. Um, and what that means is that the user has complete choice and complete freedom over how they want their financial. I mean, it's actually, it's double freedom. I'd say you have freedom to pick your community and like your, uh, how you want to interact financially. Um, but you have freedom to not constrain you to only use that you have interoperability with other, uh, financial stacks here. And, uh, that is like a cool concept. And I do see how it directly, uh, applies to his intent like framework here too where you're giving each crypto community each ecosystem complete autonomy over how they design their stack how their blockchain works what their design choices are and you are defining at the layer above um, a method to interop through this like intent layer um so i just thought it was a super cool answer Super cool answer, and it's going to lead perfectly into this next episode where that we're doing. And the title of this next episode, it's all about chain abstraction. And a lot of what we discussed today is under the would be under the umbrella of chain abstraction uh, with Ilya Polushkin of Near and Sam Hart of Skip Protocol. And actually, to give you maybe an analogy, I think Sam and Chris think about the world very similarly. He gave me this example, and I'm sure we'll probably discuss it on the episode, but imagine in a future you're buying an orange and the orange is quoted in dollars, but you have Bitcoin and I have euros. And I just like, we can transact with one another. I only ever see the Bitcoin kind of quoted price. You see the euro quoted price and you know the vendor thinks about the world in dollars. And the way that I would describe that, actually Sam would describe that as, um, localizing the store of value unit of account, like the localizing the the uh, unit of account, basically. So instead of a global accepted yardstick, everyone has their own yardstick. So maybe that's a good place to end it. Big concept. And uh, yeah, next episode is going to be great. This was a really fun one, Hart. And yeah, can't wait for next week. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It was a blast.